Okay, hi guys. Hi. We're gonna get started. How was everyone's weekend? Wonderful. Yay. Yay. Okay. Um, so many of you, if you're looking for lecture notes, they're not done. I haven't written them. I'm sorry. I was in Maine over the weekend with the solar car team, um, who is currently building their car. So and they're doing some super cool work on composites and stuff, and their Instagram is great because they have these wonderful videos on how solar-powered cars work and things like that. They're doing some fun stuff, so if you want to learn, follow them on Instagram, subtle plug. Um, and before we really start layout today, today's layout lecture, it's actually lecture three, it's not lecture four, I'm sorry. Um, that is now also updated. But, um, yes. So we decided at the end of this class we wanted to celebrate all of you wonderful people learning PCB design and hardware here. Um, and there's many ways classes usually do this. Usually we book out um, a place and you all show your project and then a whole bunch of people come and you talk about math and you talk about other things. But it's IEP and nah. So we booked out Lobby 13 on February 1st from 7 to 9 p.m. And we're going to have food and we're going to have an open non-alcoholic bar, and we are going to have a DJ and some lights and music and bring all your friends, and we're just going to have a big dance party, because why not? So yay, please come. Mark your calendars. It'll be fun. Um, oh, if you want to clap, you could clap. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo. All right. Um, oh, yes, here's my, here's my dancing groove. Um, no. You, d you did it already. You can't take it back now. Um, yes. OK, so today, today is layout. We're going to be talking about, you guys have done your schematic stuff. We're going to be talking about PCB layout, which is where you actually put the circuit on a circuit board. Um, and I'm also going to kind of call this lecture Introduction to Urban Planning for the Distinguished Electrical Engineer, because that's kind of what layout is, in the sense that like layout is I have all these things and I have these little people called electrons, and they have to go places. And how can I lay out my city on my PCB to be as, like, as good as possible? It is quite literally urban planning. And this is also where the fun part is in PCB design. It's just it's drawing lines and squiggles and squares, and it's art. This is where a lot of the art comes in, right? A good layout is a work of art. It is beautiful. You can see every aspect of what the circuit is trying to do, and you can understand the components just by looking at, looking at what's going on. Um, yes, uh, so this is my picture of a frazzled electron. It's not mine, I got it from Google. Um, but yes, so we as electrical engineers, there's a running joke, are referred to as electron herders. We herd electrons to where they gotta go. So you're responsible for the problem child in the middle who has um, a lot of things we need to consider. And layout is particularly interesting because it's all well and good to do circuit design using theory. But the moment you put theory on a PCB, things start to break down, right? Because we are now operating in the real world. And I don't know, there's a chicken over there playing a viola. And that viola noise is now interrupting the power converter on my board. How do I, how do I solve these kind of problems, right? Or there's Wi-Fi in the room, which is probably a more accurate example. Um, yes, so this is layout, schematic, into a PCB. So I'm going to start with components on the board and placement orientation. Um, essentially, when you start laying out things, right, you have this big blank square. And I want to start placing components in places that um, uh, you start placing the components down, and then you're going to connect them. You start by placing because that, um, there's a couple things you want to consider there before you actually start drawing traces. And there's this idea of separation of power and signal. So, like I said, there's, um, it's like laying out a small city, right? You have a power block, and you have a signal block. Signal block is really where all of your um, processing happens. So that's like your microcontrollers, your signal filtration, your, all the kind of stuff that the PCB like, has to do. And then there's, I need to power everything on this board, right? So then there's all your switching converters, there's all your logic, and, your LDOs and all this kind of stuff. And you kind of want to keep these things as far apart as possible. Can anyone tell me why? Your power causes noise. There's two types of power converters in, um, 
Well, okay, there's more than two types of power converters, but like we're going to talk about two types of power converters. You have switching converters, um, which is kind of like what Fisher was talking about a little bit during the motors lecture, but to clarify, um, brief review of PWM. I have, uh, I have a plus minus 12 volt DC input signal to my system. I want five volts. How do I get it? There's two ways. How do I, what's one way to get this five volt output? A do a voltage divider. So I don't know. R1, R2, and you set this so that you get five volts on the output. This is an LDO. That's fundamentally what an LDO is doing. There's a little bit extra circuitry inside there that helps you control that output voltage as the input voltage fluctuates. But an LDO is fundamentally a resistor divider. Do I get any noise on the output of an LDO? Really? No, not really, right? Any noise on the output of the LDO like, is only coming from, if I have input noise, that, that noise will translate through my resistor network into output noise, but the LDO is not fundamentally adding any noise to my system, right? It's just a resistor. Whatever voltage is here will define the voltage here. There's nothing else in here that will change what the noise profile looks like on the output of my LDO, right? What's the other way? Hint. Come on, guys. What's the other way I can get voltage? Exactly, switching converter. For a switching converter, I set a set period of time that I'm gonna switch at. This is called my switching period. Um, and this frequency of switching, which is basically that MOSFET is gonna turn on and off really fast. And what I'm gonna say is for this period of time, if I turn on the 12 volts for a certain amount of time and then I turn it off, then I turn it back on, I turn it off, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off. If I do this really, 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 really fast, the average voltage that comes out is gonna be my five volt signal. Does this add noise to my system? Absolutely. I'm taking a 12 volt signal and I'm going bang, 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 at like 50, like some, most of these switching converters are operating like 250 kilohertz. That's a ridiculous amount of noise that I'm putting on my system. So you wanna keep these switching converters and all this kind of stuff as far away from all of your sensitive power, like your sensitive electronics that are on your board, right? Because otherwise, all this noise is gonna have a field day ruining your circuit. Yeah, so this is just, that's what an LDO looks like. This is what a switching converter usually looks like on a board. So. Here are some examples of separation of power and signal. You can see on this side, this is a battery management system. So I'm sorry, the laser pointer doesn't work. But on this side, what's basically happening is I have a whole bunch of things, if you remember back to lab two, where we briefly explained how a battery management system works. This is where the high power current and all that kind of stuff is going through your system. This is where all the power conversion is happening to power components of your system. And then on this side of the board is where the microcontroller lies, all of the capacitors lies and all the things that basically read voltages, right? So like I have a battery, I wanna read the voltage, I wanna read the current, I wanna read all this kind of information about what the, what the battery is doing and then make decisions based on that. And that's gonna live on this side of the board completely separate from where my power is. Does that make sense? Cool. Now, there's other ways there's other things to think about in, in layout. Number one, is, uh, number two is actually like, it comes down to like placement of components as well and minimizing the length of my traces. So when I, when I have a board, the, the first thing I start with, like I have this board, right, and I have a bunch of components. I'm first gonna decide, okay, let me maybe, for argument's sake, split my board in half, put all my power stuff on this side, and put all my signal stuff on this side, right? And then after that, I also need to consider the orientation and placement of my components with respect to each other. 
Because within this signal block and within this power block, where do I put my components? Um, so if you remember back to 802, Faraday's law, I have big loop. And I have magnetic field from the environment. Where can this magnetic field come from in the environment? If we're sitting here. Where is, is there a magnetic field source in this room? Wi-Fi is a magnetic field source. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sure. <laughs> but wasn't expecting that one. So this is my solar flare. Which, unironically, you do have to consider if you're designing a satellite. Um, so there's, those are a couple examples, right? And basically, this field is like switching all the time. So what's going to happen on this side of this loop? If I have a, this is just a random loop of wire for now. What's going to happen on that side of the loop? Current. Through the loop, yes, we'll generate a current through the loop, and then we'll generate a voltage on the output. Essentially, I'll get a noise that I didn't want to get, right? I'll get some like weird, I don't, I don't know what this will look like. Who knows? Um, but the point is, I don't want that. So you want to minimize the distance. See, like, this is bad. You see how this, like, piece of wire, this, this trace is going, like, all the way around this entire board and then snaking up, like, some weird US highway all the way to, like, the top corner of, of like, the PCB here? Let's say I put this next to a motor. What's going to happen across the terminals of that, of that trace? It's just going to generate power like nobody's business into like, I don't even know. That looks like it's measuring current. If I'm measuring current, I don't want to be generating random voltage signals across my, across my entire trace, right? So the idea is to keep things as compact as possible. And I'll kind of do an example of that right now on the board. So this is a switching converter. Um, this is the switching converter that is in your PCB design that you'll be, the Bluetooth speaker that you'll be laying out. For the record, do not take the layout I'm about to do on the board and use it in your PCB design because I have no idea what the pinout of your switching converter is. I'm going to be completely guessing the package. But for argument's sake, I'm going to show you where I would place the components, right? So you're going to start with your chip in your switching converter because everything in this circuit is connected to this chip, right? You're going to populate your power converter around this chip because all of the components here are connected to that chip. So you start by putting your, putting your circuit somewhere, or your chip somewhere. Now, where on this PCB would I put it for now? In the power side. But do I care really right now at this instant of my layout where in this power plane I'm putting it? No, I don't care. Put it somewhere, right? And then I can move it around later. So I'm going to start with this, this chip. I have, this is a V-in pin. This is an enable pin. Um, this is some, I don't know, some compensation. This is something else. You'd have to check the data sheet for what that stuff is doing. But that's probably setting parameters. I have three grounds. No, I shouldn't do that. Sorry. Ground. Ground, ground. And then I have uh, there's another. There's a flyback. There's like a, a feedback pin here. And then there's uh, my, my output to my, to, my, uh, to my converter. And inside here, there's a little transistor that's going while it's, um, while it's doing things. So, um, Where would I, where would you guys start by placing components? Where would I put the inductor? Yeah, really close to the output. So I would say the inductor is also bridging my input and my output pin, right, like that in the schematic. You might not get this lucky, but honestly, I would take this inductor, I would put it right here, because then I can run a trace as short as possible from here to here, and then here to here, right? Then, 
we have a diode, and we have some resistors. We'll get to the capacitors later in a minute, because I'm going to talk about that on the next slide. But um, we have a diode and some resistors. I'm going to take a big, I, I can place a resistor between here and my ground plane, because I know these are all, all going to be connected to ground. So I can use a copper pore, which I'll get to in a couple slides, to connect all this stuff together. I can put another resistor up here, connect a pad between them, and stick the feedback through here. And then I can take the diode and put it as close to my chip as possible to minimize the length of those traces, right? And like that'll make a little more sense when I start showing you layouts on, on the next couple of slides to show like how compact can I, can I really get a circuit. But the idea is you want to orient your component, right? Because also, the other thing I could have done here is like the diode goes this way. I could have put the diode this way and then drawn the trace like this, right? But now my trace is really longer than it needs to be. So I want to flip my component around, get that trace as short as possible, and to minimize things like my inductance loops and all, this, all the parasitics that could be happening in my circuit. Does that make sense, Orientate, like orienting your components to like keep that trace as small as possible? Yeah. OK. So. Many people ask this in lab, and I want to take a few minutes to explain it because it is a fairly important concept when you're getting to layout. Um, what are these capacitors? Why are there 500 capacitors connected to every chip on the board? What are they doing? Sarah. Mm, no, not really. These are called bypass capacitors. And I'm going to explain this concept using our favorite IKEA shark. Bear with me. It, it will make sense. Nope, I don't want this. OK. You get enough math in 6002. Let's do something that's not math and is conceptual. So inside every capacitor, there is a very hungry shark. The shark's hunger is a function of how big the shark is and the size of the food I'm giving it, right? If I'm a big shark, what kind of food do I want? Big food. Big food. If I am small shark, what kind of what kind of food do I want? Small food. Small food. So, I am a shark. I'm going to plot the amount of monch from no monch to very much monch as a function of food size. And this is big food, and this is small food. I am a relatively large shark. Where am I most likely to eat food on this axis? Towards the bottom, right? So like, I'm going to say, like, OK, yes, over here, there's a very high likelihood that I will monch. But this curve isn't just going to look like this, right? I'm an animal. I'm not going to eat only one size of food. There's just a decreasing chance that I will eat the food if it's smaller or larger, because I'm a hungry shark, right? Here, the food is too big, but maybe I'll try. So what's this curve going to look like? It'll look something like that, right? Here, I really probably won't try. But then I'll try harder and harder and harder until I get to this point. And then on this side of the curve, what's going to happen? Yeah, I'll try. I'll try less and less and less and less and less, right? 
capacitor, Monge curve. So what's happening here, right, is like, uh, I don't want to do this. I apologize for this terrible board use, but uh, we'll go over here. I have many, many different signals from the environment coming into my chip, right? I have Wi-Fi at, I don't know, this is Wi-Fi at 200 and, no, sorry, this is 2.4 gigahertz. I have a switching converter somewhere on my board at 250 kilohertz. And I have a motor spinning in the corner of the room that's giving me noise at like 40 hertz. So we have large food, small food. So I want to get rid of all of these kinds of signals, right? I don't want any of these signals coming through to my chip. I just want like a flat DC source. But all of these things, they're going to add. I'm going to have a large. I'm going to have a medium. I'm going to have a. I'm going to have all these three waves adding into noise coming into my chip, right? So, how would I get rid of all three of these noises? Three bypass caps, right? So I'm going to get one shark here. He's going to be a large shark. He's going to be like a 300 nanofarad shark. And then we're going to have like, like, a, like, I don't know, a smaller shark, maybe like, like a 50 nanofarad shark. Oh, and this shark is also going to be an electrolytic shark. Um, and then over here, we're going to have a one nanofarad shark, very tiny shark. So. I am large food. Large food comes here. This shark says, no, I'm not going to eat that. This shark goes, no, I'm not going to eat that. This shark goes, I'm going to eat that. Yummy. And that noise goes to the ground plane. I have 40 hertz, 40 hertz food. This middle shark goes, oh, look, perfect size for me. This shark goes, nope, too big for me. This shark goes, nope, I'm not, um, that's not going to feed me. 50 narrow farad shark eats medium food, and then one narrow farad shark eats small food. Have you ever heard of the Lee Foley law? And like the three bears? Yeah. I feel like that works perfectly in Goldilocks as well. Goldilocks shark. <laughs> um. So you're probably like, okay, I am, I am smart, and I have taken 802, and I know that the impedance of a shark is 1 over j omega c, right? Okay, we can go back to capacitors now. I'm done with sharks. Does everybody understand shark? Cool. So I, the impedance of a capacitor, if you want more math, impedance of a capacitor is 1 over j omega c for an ideal capacitor, right? But I am manufacturing a physical component. There is no way it only has just a capacitance, right? It's going to have an inductance. It's going to have a resistance. It's going to have all these other non-idealities that are, that are coming from me having a capacitor there, right? And the reason you actually need multiple bypass capacitors is because of this um, equivalent series resistance and equivalent series inductance, sorry, because normally um, the transfer function of a capacitor is just a decreasing line like this. But when you add in that resistance and that inductance, that's where this like upward curve comes from. And this is the resonant, this frequency here is the resident frequency of my shark. Does everybody understand bypass capacitance? Yeah? Any questions on bypass capacitance? Why are the bypass capacitors like, built into the chips themselves? Do you want to take that? Yeah. Um, 
It's because we usually want a lot of control over what we're actually putting on our board. Um, you'll also see sometimes in data sheets, uh, manufacturers will, especially for certain like um, precise chips where it like really, really cares about the voltage input, like some of the microcontrollers as well, will actually tell you, I want you to put this capacitor here. It'll specify it. And in that case, the reason they're doing, the, the why they wouldn't put it in the chip is exactly what Fisher said, is that the capacitor is like, I mean, you want the chip to be this big, and the capacitor is like this big, especially for some of the smaller chips. And the larger size helps you, um, in certain cases, like get the right uh, internal properties you need, get that resistance, that equivalent series resistance down, get that equivalent series inductance down, and things like that. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is like what we just explained with the sharks. Usually you have, um, you will usually see multiple bypass capacitors. Some chips will have few ones. Like there's a lot of like chips that are like very tolerable in the sense of like they can take some noise on their input and you'll just see the one narrow farad or the 10, uh, 10, 10 nano farad or something on the output. But usually the better, like the better more filtered designs will have multiple capacitors dealing with many levels of input. Um, and really what you're doing is you're taking a look at these capacitor ESR curves, which if it's a good capacitor, it's in the data sheet. If it's a bad capacitor, you're gonna have to find and draw it yourself. But they'll, they'll look like this for the different capacitors. And then here's your, um, for people who have taken um, 6002 or some equivalent like, Bode, like class where you do Bode plots or controls or things like that, this is your like negative three dB mark on your log scale. And if you draw a line across, you'll filter out anything under that negative three decibel point mark. Um, so it's not just the resonant frequency it takes care of. It's um, you size the capacitor looking at uh, one of your marks on your log scale. Does that make sense to people? People good? Cool. OK, so where, oh, I was going to ask this before I showed this, but now I've showed it. Um, Okay, so where, ideally, where would I put the bypass capacitor? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. Sorry, I should have drawn that. Um, so, basically, right, I have... I have a couple signals adding when I have my power power line coming in, right? I have my, the here's like the five volt signal I want. Then I'm gonna add my 40 hertz wave, my high frequency wave, my high frequency wave. And then when I have my three caps, it's gonna, this one's gonna sync one, this one's gonna sync other, this one's gonna sync the third. And ideally on the output, I'm just getting a straight five volt DC. Um, there obviously will be some noise. We can't eliminate 100% of noise. But the, the goal is really to get this noise threshold down to a tolerable level for the chip. What does tolerable mean? That's defined in the data sheet most of the time, if it's a good data sheet. Some garbage data sheets won't tell you anything. Um, but. And honestly, there are more garbage data sheets than useful data sheets. So you kind of look at useful data sheets and you get an understanding of what chips really like and then you say, okay, I'm gonna just apply this general knowledge to most of the chips who really don't define it. Because if they don't define it, it's generally following like uh, an average rule. They don't care too much about um, the, the stuff that's going into the chip. Um, does that answer your question? Cool, yeah. Right, so honestly, most of the time, if you know the noise that is gonna be coming into your system, right? Um, so like, let's say I was designing a, a PCB for a very specific location, I know where it was gonna be or something like that, I can characterize my system noise and I can pick my capacitors so that like, I can filter out every single noise I care about. Or if there's a noise that you have injected, like oftentimes when manufacturers make the chip, they'll do like frequency tests and all this kind of stuff to determine what, what 
frequencies injected in this chip are like the most harmful to operation. Like if you know there's a frequency that's particularly damaging, whether that's in your environment or not, you would put a, you'd size a capacitor to get rid of that. Oftentimes what's happening is we don't actually really know the noise. We, um, we, can, we can set an acceptable threshold though, right? So I can say like maybe my chip, you know, like a 10 hertz noise is fine, it's not that many cycles per second, as long as the magnitude is low, we're okay. So on general rules, that's where the general rules come in. You'll often see like, oh my god, go away, shark. Like a one nanofarad capacitor is pretty much standard on every single, on, on every single um, chip. And then it usually you'll get another like 10 to 100 nanofarad capacitor on the output to filter out some of the larger noise. Like those two capacitors are very standard and they're usually ceramic capacitors which have slightly lower equivalent series resistance, but um, do a pretty good job filtering out the noise. The electrolytic capacitor is to filter out really, really like, um, like low, like really on the lower frequency side noises, because after that what's happening is um, like uh, the, the, the series resistance is going very high and then it's like drop, it can't filter that kind of stuff out. Um, and that'll be on like more sensitive chips. Like I think this is on the what? Um, this is on the, I think this one is on actually the, uh, the, yeah, the audio amp, right? So like we. It's in the reference, there's a reference. So oftentimes when Texas Instruments sells a chip, especially like some of the, the better manufacturers for chips, like Texas Instruments, LTI, like, uh, sorry, L yeah, LTI. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all of them, like, especially for their more sensitive chips, they'll have, what they'll release with the data sheet, they'll also release a design guide or an ex example layout or something. And then basically that's, they just use the chip and they show you how to use the chip and then you take a lot of that and you use it in your, in your design. Another reason for the big electrolytic capacitor, like Fisher was saying, is audio signals we know exist in a certain range. So if we're getting a signal that's above that range, or we're getting a signal that's below that range, or we can decide what range our speaker can accept and take and get rid of any signals that are above or below the range that my speaker can accept. In the case of audio engineering, we very much care about the noise on the rail, right? Because you, like Fisher said, you hear it. Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, so that, that gets back to, um, so electrolytic capacitors, basically what happens inside, and I think Fisher may have briefly mentioned this at some point, but like what's happening inside is you have this like uh, roll of like gel, essentially. That's going, you have this, this rolled up plate and all this gel on the inside of the capacitor. And because of the construction of the capacitor, it tends to have a very high Where's my capacitor model? I didn't draw it, but the, the series resistance, equivalent series resistance of my capacitor is like this ESR over here is usually super high. Um, and like base, because of that, those capacitors really, really do not work at high frequencies at all. But they're really good at this low range of frequencies and they're really good at storing very large amounts of energy so like usually electrolytic capacitors will have a higher capacitance rating, but they're store, like, they store a lot of energy, but they don't really work at high frequencies. And b but because of that, they're a very good bypass cap for things in the range of like, if I want to get rid of low frequencies. But they're terrible when it comes to getting rid of high frequencies, so they just don't work. But as the frequency 
frequency increases, um, that capacitance starts like you know um, having like zero and two. These kids trying to like get rid of all the high frequency, but the inductor works in the opposite way, where um, we'll start fighting at high frequency. So that's why we start getting that like increasing trend line on the um, on the right of that graph. There. It's because the inductance that's like parasitically part of our capacitor starts dominating. It's like circuit characteristics, if that makes sense. Cool. All right. So more importantly for what you guys are doing right now is not necessarily how to calculate bypass capacitance. It's what people have been asking. It's an important concept. And usually it happens in the layout stage rather than the early stages of design because that's when you're putting, their, putting your circuit together so it actually works is the location of bypass capacitors. So now I've showed the slide a couple times. You want to stick your bypass capacitor as close to your chip as humanely possible. Um, can someone tell me why? That, so you can see, though, like, like this, this, is, this and this capacitor are basically at the same location with respect to the chip, but this layout is worse than that layout. Can someone tell me why this layout is worse? Exactly. What you've done is you've taken out noise and then you've added it back in by putting a huge inductance loop into your circuit. So that inductor will come and pull, pull even more noise into your system. So what this is telling you to do is you have, you have your PCB, right? You have your, your chip. You have your bypass capacitor close to the chip. And then um, You have some layers, right? You can create a ground plane over here, like we said in um, Fisher's first lecture. And what they're saying is instead of if you, have a, if you have a ground pin here on this side of the chip coming out of the board, and you have a ground point you want to connect to here, it's better to take a via and send these stuff down to the, down to the ground plane instead of creating loops in your system that um, you can pull uh, that can pull that can pull pull noise out of your circuit. Um, yeah. Do you generally have to worry about like Wi-Fi and early noise? Um, I mean, you always have to worry about it. But in terms of Wi-Fi, like, and Wi-Fi is like, if you put if you put de decoupling capacitors like the one nanofarad and the fifty nanofarad, you're like generally fine. Wi-Fi is also not a super strong. Um, electromagnetic signal that is going to be interfering with your PCB. But for example, if you have an inductance loop that's in the right place and w close enough to a Wi-Fi circuit, then really that, in like if you get rid of the inductance loops, Wi-Fi won't be that much of a problem because there isn't anything for the Wi-Fi to induct in or like create a, like do Faraday's law. Um, you know, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, if I had multiple bypass capacitors, I would try to keep them all as close to the chip as possible as well, usually in like a parallel stack. Yeah? Cool. How am I doing on time? It's been like 45 minutes. OK. Um, I'm going to briefly touch uh, locations of like filtration and or you know what? We'll skip filtration and debounce because it's not super relevant to the layout we're doing. but. And I'll cover it briefly, actually. So um, a debounce capacitor is this, this is another type of filtration capacitor. If we put a button on our circuit, like a physical button that you're pressing, oftentimes what happens is like our fingers are not like perfect. Like when I press a button, there's no guarantee that it's going to slam closed immediately. It's going to like shudder a little bit, or the metals like when the metals hit together, they can like they can do this right because it's a real physical device. So you'll get this like weird. Um, Weird like fluctuations in noise where you start at zero volts, it like bounces a little bit, and then you go to um, the switch turns on. Yeah. So this is what's called um, this, we call that bouncing. So oftentimes what we'll do is we'll put a little filter on the output called an RC filter, like RC filter called a debounce filter. And in general, you want to get those as close to the button as possible, which was the point I'm trying to make. The thing that like, you usually want all your filtration equipment as close to the thing that is being filtered as possible. Does that, that concept make sense to people? You don't want it to like, the, more, the farther away you put it, the more time that trace that you're running has time to pick up even more and more noise, and then your filter becomes useless. Um, 
same thing with electrostatic discharge, but um, I'll link some stuff in the next year notes about that. Um, so there's two sides to a PCB. There's the, there's the top and the bottom. I will briefly cover this. Usually, um, what side of the board you place components on is generally more of a manufacturing consideration than it is an electrical consideration. I will say, in most cases, sometimes you will see, and I'll show this on another slide um, later in the presentation, sometimes what you will see is if this is my PCB and this is my, this is my chip, there are some layouts that will put bypass capacitors on this side of the board and run vias like this to, to do bypass. In general, it's not a great practice because like you have to go through this entire via and depending on the thickness of your board, that's like um, not, um, not fantastic. Uh, it also creates inductance loops just in a different plane. It creates an inductance loop going this way rather than this way. Um, but yeah, the other thing is, especially on boards that are like, that, that you're gonna mass manufacture, um, in terms of like creating the actual PCB layers, the cost doesn't really differ between um, putting components on the bottom versus co putting components on the top. But if you get to automated population, like for example, if you say, I wanna manufacture 100 of these boards, I want you to manufacture the board and I want you to put all the components on it. If you have components on this side and this side, um, all manufacturing, like all that cost comes in setup cost. So like the more they have to flip the board, the more expensive the PCB becomes to manufacture. So those are considerations. Um, another consideration is like if you want to debug the board easily, if all the components are on one side, then I don't need to be sitting there flipping my board over to debug components. Oftentimes with high voltage battery management systems, they will put all the components on one side of the board because if they need to debug it in the car around like high voltage systems, they don't wanna be reaching in there and lifting up the PCB to probe things, right? That's dangerous. So they'll put all the components on one side to debug the PCB properly. Um, things like the iPhone, you're probably using all sides of the board because you have so many components and you want it to fit in as small a space as possible. The more, if you put more components on the other side, you can like, like think about it. If you have, um, if you have a board that requires this amount of area of circuit components, if you take, if you put components on the bottom, you can reduce your board area by like half, almost at maximum, right? You can take all these components, put it on the under and then make the board like this big. In general, maybe you want to do it, maybe you don't want to do it. It depends on your like power and signal considerations. Um, usually I start with um, a two layer board with components on one side, unless there is a reason to put components on the bottom. Um, yes, so I'm gonna briefly go over tools for routing, um, just to mention them here so that when we put them in the notes for the lab tomorrow, you're not like, what is this and why is it here? Um, so there's a couple ways like to actually, like once you've actually placed all your components out, you have to connect them all together and that's called routing often. Um, usually what will happen is, like I was saying before, you'll do, you'll organize your sub circuits, like your take, like I'm gonna start with my power converter, I'm gonna place all my components for my power converter. I'm gonna take my, uh, my microcontroller, I'm gonna place all my components for my microcontroller and they'll all be in these little squares on your Altium layout. And then you can like bring them together and organize them on your PCB. So you have all your, little, all your little components, but none of them are connected together. And then that's what your PCB is gonna look like before you move to drawing traces. The moment you start drawing traces, it gets hard to move things around. So you kind of want things to be roughly in their final places before you start drawing traces here and there, because moving a trace gets weird. It, like sometimes it like will move all your components and then the trace will go like, ooh, or something like that. It won't, like, it won't move the trace in Altium. That's just a weird quirk of it. Um, yes, uh, there's also this great feature in Altium called the auto router, and by great, I mean terrible. Um, the auto router is a button where if you place all your components and you hit auto route, it will connect all the things together. It does absolutely, it has zero considerations on anything I have said in the previous 45 minutes, it just, basically does graph search and connects everything to everything else. It also, sometimes it won't even consider things like how big does this trace need to be to like dump power, right? It has no idea. It'll just take a trace size and it'll go boom. It's useful for some things like BGA fan out when you don't wanna be like, 
like, I don't know, running 5 million 400 traces. But like other than things like that, you generally don't want to be touching the auto router. Like route the stuff yourself. Um, yes. OK. So I'm going to briefly talk about calculating a trace. Actually, it's been 45 minutes. Let's take a five minute break. And then we'll come back at uh, uh, whatever, five minutes. Um, and then I'll go through this.
Okay, I think we're gonna get started again so we can um, uh, we can finish finish hopefully on time. Um, okay, so I'm gonna briefly talk about calculating trace width and spacing. This is another really large layout consideration in a lot of systems, especially when you're doing high power systems or high voltage systems. The amount of current you're running through a trace is gonna matter a lot, or the distance between the traces is gonna matter a lot. So there's there's two cases here, right? Uh, a copper, like a copper trace on a PCB has a couple characteristic dimensions. It has uh, a trace width. Usually in Altium, the unit will be mils. It's on, on the slide if you can't read it here. It has a trace length, and that's the total length of the trace running from the beginning of the trace to the end of the trace. And then it has a trace thickness. The thickness is in a weird unit called ounces. And don't confuse that for like weight. We do call it the weight of the trace, but it, it really refers to the thickness. And the, the unit conversion is here. An ounce is 1.37 mils. Um, and a mil is a thousandth of an inch. I don't know where that came from. I'm going to be honest with you, but it's what we have. So anytime you go and you define the layer stack, and I think you guys looked at it in lab one, the layer stack manager, for Altium, it'll ask you what is the ounce weighting of the copper on each of the layers of your of your of your uh, each of the copper layers in your in your PCB, and that refers to the the thickness of the trace. Yeah. Oh oh okay okay yes yeah. okay that's that makes sense. So that's where it comes from. Um, but why they decide to do that as the unit, I don't know. But um, it's probably have to, I would guess, based on that explanation, it probably has to do with the fact that like, when they're calculating PCB cost, if they know, like, the thick, like if they do it in terms of ounces, they're going to buy copper by, by weight, right? And, like, and volume and density and all that kind of stuff. So that's probably where it came from. It's a cost-based metric of how you um, um, I, I'm not saying that for sure. I, based on your explanation, I think that's probably why they chose it. But um, yes. So anyway, um, we know from uh, who's taken 802. I keep forgetting. Can we get a show of hands of who's taken 802? OK, so we got, a, we got a good amount of people. So if I give you the formula, resistance is equal to rho, which is yes. Resistivity of copper times L, L which is the length, of your the length of my trace over A, A my cross-sectional area, right? So for every single one of my traces, I can calculate um, if I do some unit conversions. I'm not going to do it on the slide here because like, you can figure it out fairly easily. But basically, you take the cross-sectional area. You multiply by the length, and you can get the resistance of that trace. Now, resistance probably doesn't matter if you're not running a whole bunch of current through it, or if your signals are like at a low enough frequency. But when you're getting to high frequencies and you're getting to high power, obviously, if I have a trace that's about, I don't know, this wide, you can't see it. That's the point. If I have a trace that's this wide, I'm not running 400 amps of current through it. Um, so instead of me spending a very long time explaining all the steps for uh, like trace sizing, all that kind of stuff, I'm going to link. There's a really good tutorial from uh, from Maxim Integrated Circuits, and I'm going to post it on. Or sorry, it's MCLPCB actually. There's a really good tutorial from MCLPCB on how to accurately size all your trace stuff. I'm going to post it in the lecture notes. Um, feel free to give it a read. Um, in general, for most applications, um, if you assume a one ounce copper PCB. 
these trace widths generally work. There are also tables you can look up. There are tables you can look up based on the ounces weight, ounce rating of your copper, your trace thickness, how much current is my um, PCB trace going to handle. Now, there is a caveat to this. All these ratings assume certain thermal properties of your, of your system, right? Because all of my, what's going to happen here if I, if I run, if I run current through a resistor, sorry, what's going to happen to this resistor? It's going to heat up, right? It's going to start at a certain ambient temperature. Based on the current that's going through it, it's going to dissipate power, going to power is equal to I squared times R, depending on how well this, this trace or this resistor is cooled, it will dissipate, it will be able to like deal with that dissipated power differently, right? If I have a trace that's embedded deep in my 20 layer PCB, like I have, um, I have a motherboard here and motherboards are like honestly sometimes tearing layers deep. If I have a trace in there on layer five, and I have all this dielectric like insulation between layer five and the top of the PCB, it's probably not going to dissipate thermal energy very well. It's probably going to up, heat up really well, uh, or really muchly. It's going to heat up a lot. Um, and then, but if I have a trace at the top and it's very wide, it can dissipate power well. And if I've used thermal vias, it can handle, um, it can handle much higher higher current loads depending on sizing. So it very much depends on your environment. What, this, uh, what these are calculated based on is an accepted temperature rise of the trace. How much can I allow my trace to heat up? And once you decide that specification, you calculate your trace widths and all that kind of stuff based on the accepted temperature rise of each of the traces in my, in my circuit. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Cool. I will link a tutorial on like how exactly you you take that temperature rise and then get a uh, then get a trace width and stuff from that. But um, yes, trace spacing. So the the size of your trace depends on um, how much current is running through it. So size is current. The spacing between your traces on your PCB is defined by how much voltage is being stood off by those two traces. So for example, if I have a voltage source coming in, right, maybe it's a, I have a voltage source coming in. On my actual PCB, I'll have like trace one that's going to the power supply, and I'll have trace two that's going to the power supply. The physical distance here, how big that physical distance needs to be depends on the value of this voltage. Can anyone tell me why? Yes. Does anybody know what that's called? Sparking across two parallel charge storage devices? Breakdown. breakdown, dielectric breakdown. So if I have a conductor, and if I have a conductor, and I have something that's not a conductor in between, this is, has a dielectric constant, KD, of some value. For air, that's 30 kilovolts per centimeter. On the PCB, tra on the PCB depends on where the traces are, depends on how you've like, set your dielectrics. It'll be slightly higher or lower, depending on that. Um, and like you can tell, like if I want 30 kilovolts of voltage across these two things, I need at least a centimeter of space, probably more, right? Otherwise, I'll get an arc straight through my PCB and everything will blow up and we'll be sad. Um, one of the ways we do, uh, I don't know, do I have it on this slide? Okay, I have it on another slide, but basically, um, one of the ways we can increase our dielectric constant is some boards will actually have a physical slot like milled out, so it's like just air in there, and air has one of the highest dielectric constants we can, we can put in a PCB. So that's where like high voltage isolation systems, you'll see a physical slot milled into the PCB, and that's mostly for isolation. Um, okay, 
Planes and the Layer Stack Manager, we're gonna go through this briefly, um, just because you're not going to be designing something like this. This is a motherboard. Um, and it looks ridiculous, because it is ridiculous. All motherboards are ridiculous when it comes to layout, because, I mean, look, just look at the number of components that are on this board. Like, it's insane. I can pass this around so people can look at it. And also, if you look at on the back side, they, they do put the bypass capacitors on the back side of this board. And they've done some fun engineering to get that to work. But the only thing on the back of this board are bypass capacitors, which is a fairly common design practice. Whether we think it's good or not, it is, there's still some debate, depending on your system. Um, but then to get all of these components to connect to each other, like this Intel chip probably has, like, has hundreds and hundreds of pins on it, right? And getting, getting it to route to all of the places it needs to go, and this board has two processors too. Um, getting it to go to all the places it needs to go, I'm not gonna be able to fit all the traces on just one layer or two layers of board. So what they have is layers of board where like the first layer deals with a lot of, um, a lot of the traces, like there's traces sitting on top of traces as you go down down layers. Mostly the amount of layers of a PCB really just has to do with how many things you need to connect to other things. The more layers you have, the higher the cost. So like in general, you start with two layers and if you can't fit it on two layers, you go more. Um, but I'll pass these around so people can look at how wonderfully insane they are. Um, so that's from a server. And this one is from a gaming computer, I think. Yeah, what's up? So all the little dots on that outline are just all the pins from like the cards, the processors, all the different things that are like basically making the computer. So some of them are probably pins, but most of them are vias. So what's happening, all these little dots on this board, basically you have to get the signals from that chip to the layers below that to route them across the board, I need to use a via to transport it to that like plane. So in this case, these are ground vias that are transporting my ground signals to the ground plane. But in here, I will also have signal vias that are trans, so if I have two traces on top of each other, like let's say I have a chip here and I need this, a trace from one pin of the chip to go this way, but I also need a trace from, from this pin to go this way. Sometimes on a motherboard, what we'll do is insert a via here and then send the trace this way so they're right on top of each other, especially if they're going to like the same component location over here. They'll put a via here and you'll connect like that. I make Some of the pins will be on top of vias. Sometimes what they often do is like, here's the pin, and they send a trace this way, and then they put the via here. Um, generally, in industry, from what I've heard, it is not a good practice to place a pin on t a via on top of a pin. And the reason for this is a via actually has some upwards dimension off the board. So like, here's the flat part of the board. Here's my, here's my copper pad and my via is just slightly higher. Not by much, but it's enough to mess up a pick and place machine sometimes. And also like if there's a via on this one and a pin right next to it that doesn't have a via, my solder flow, like this pin may not connect because like the chip is like elevated ever so slightly off the board. Um, so generally they stick the via off, off the, uh, um, the pin. Um, and yeah, so I usually, for you guys as well, I start with two layers and then I go, then I add as needed. It's gonna be pretty obvious when you need more than two layers because you will have saturated the amount of traces that you can run across the board and also, yeah. Um, it's, it's very common sometimes when you have like, when you have like stuff going across a board and like, like if there's something in this, in this corner of the board, sometimes this, okay, well I'm gonna draw it somewhere, I'll draw it somewhere else. Like if this is my PCB, if I have a component here that needs to connect to a component here, and I have a component here that needs to connect to a component here, I can't run these traces on the same layer because they'll sit on top of each other and that's not how copper works. So I need to put um, this trace on the bottom, this trace on the top. Obviously you wanna to try to avoid this as much as possible, so that's why you spend most of your time in layout doing what we did 
talked about during the first half of the lecture of placing your components to try and think about where the traces are going, trying to minimize the distance of the traces, how far they have to go, how much they have to cross. You spend most of your time doing that and probably the least amount of time actually drawing the traces. Um, so, but sometimes in certain boards, especially motherboards, stuff like this is unavoidable. And then like in a motherboard, you have another one that's over here that needs to connect to this that's going like this, and this is going like this, like this, and now you need at least four layers, right? Maybe these two could be on the same layer, but you need at least three to get this done, depending on your layout. Um, because there are other constraints to PCBs, right? Like I can't just necessarily put the component exactly where I want to put it. In a computer, I need space for RAM slots. I need to put the GPU in a certain place because it needs to mount to a certain place on the chassis. I have standards for all those kind of mechanical components of the design. So like, depending on those constraints, oftentimes you add layers because you have a mechanical constraint that, needs, that means a component has to be in a certain place. Um, cool. Um, vias we covered briefly. Vias are, um, this is just an interesting practice I wanted to show you with microcontrollers. Sometimes what you're, so okay, I will preface this by saying now that I look at this picture, I have no idea why those traces are curved like C's. That's really weird. That's a weird, don't do that. That's dumb. Um, but like normally you would draw a straight line, you'd come over, you want your like nice 45 degree angles. I don't even know how you draw a curved trace. Um, but like, the point is, what you'll see oftentimes is like most chips have these pins around the outside, and unless it's like a really high power chip, um, it won't have anything in the middle. Sometimes chips will have something in the middle. It's a large ground plane or a thermal plane where it's sinking thermal energy through the PCB. Oftentimes it won't, especially with most microcontrollers. So a good practice is instead of shoving vias all around the outside of the microcontroller, they'll just shove the vias right under the microcontroller because it doesn't matter that much. And then it gets into considerations on like, how much does my pad come off my PCB and how much does my P like via come off my PCB? And as long as the via is shorter than the distance the pad comes off the PCB, it won't affect any manufacturing issues. So that's actually a very common practice. Um, yes. Um, cool. Polygon pores. Um, I'm just going to briefly mention also because like this is a concept that I didn't I didn't know initially um, when I was doing PCB design. Oftentimes people will assume that they need a whole layer for power and a whole layer for ground because a lot of PCBs on the internet what they'll do is they'll be like, here's my signal layer one, here's my five volt plane, here's my ground plane, here's my signal layer two, and then anything that's powered by five volt and ground gets via'd straight down to this layer, which is great because then I can connect anything over the board. Uh, across the entire board without running traces left and right across my entire board to get power. Um, but sometimes, especially when you have manufacturing considerations like cost, this is not a great move. So this board was designed for D-Lab. Um, we were making a UV disinfection box for uh, low, like low income hospitals in South Africa um, during the pandemic. And the idea here was like we wanted a PCB so people weren't like spending a lot of time soldering all these components together, but it needed to be as small in footprint as possible so it could be co low cost and it could be only two layers because that's all we had money for. Um, so what we decided to do here, you can see when we're running power, we have this large red, um, red thing over there that's running power, but that's not, um, that's not a trace. That's called a polygon pore. And what we're doing there is in Altium, the pore function, what you do is you, um, you draw an outline. You hit like, uh, like add pore. You draw an outline like this. You click on it. You hit properties. You choose a net that you want it to connect to. So for example, either my power net or my ground net or this is a signal net um, pore. And then you just and then it will fill it in, and any via that is sitting there, or any component that's sitting there on that has the same net, it will automatically connect to that pore. Um, pores are great, especially for high current stuff. This one is actually a fairly high current board because it's powering LE, uh, UV LEDs, which take a, a serious amount of power. The other thing you'll notice here is the split ground plane. So um, one of the ways to save money in this board, for those of you who are familiar with transistors, um, uh, there's two types of switches. I can have a high side switch or a low side switch. So a transistor on the high side is, if I have a totem pole like this, right, 
Um, this is my high side switch. This is my low side switch. A low side switch has something connected to, has like its, what is it? Gate drain source. Source is connected to ground. Whereas in, in a high side transistor, I have gate, drain, source. No. Gate, drain, source. Sorry. What am I doing? Gate. Source is connected to some unknown voltage, which means I need a special chip that reads this voltage and drives this. Uh, to turn a transistor on, it's the um, gate source voltage, VGS, that matters. So I need to read this voltage, create that voltage, and then turn the transistor on, whereas on a, on a ground side one, I don't necessarily need um, a gate drive chip because I know that this reference is with respect to ground. If you're a little more interested in this topic, um, 6131 or some other, there's other classes, and I'll link some resources on like where this comes from. But basically, we chose to use a low side switch because we don't need a gate drive chip that saves uh, like a good amount of circuitry going into um, the PCB. And you'll see what we did to connect the grounds together is we have a ground plane that's over here, um, which is all the stuff we wanted to turn on. And this is our main input plane. So this is where like all the, the this is this plane is where the power was coming in. This is all the stuff we wanted to turn on. These were the LEDs. So then what we did is we put this low side switch right in the middle. You see that CNV underscore ground two, that big switch in the middle is a low side switch connecting these planes together. And the way we did this is using polygon pores. Um, cool. Um, brief, brief stuff. So there's this, because uh, if you guys Google, you'll have, um, have some fun with reading all the arguments about 90 degree traces on um, electrical engineering dot stack exchange. Um, so this is directly from Altium. A lot of the time, if you Google, people will tell you, don't route your traces at 90 degrees like this, because you'll get an electric field concentration, and that'll upset your system. The reason that where this comes from is if you're using super high frequency signals. So motherboards do have to think about this because their clock speeds are usually in like like multiple like multiple gigahertz clock speeds, right? Like what the Intel's up to like what 3.9 gigahertz now or something like something ridiculous. Um, so if you have a 3.9 gigahertz signal coming into this trace, if you turn it like if you turn it at 90 degrees like this, the signal will actually reflect back on itself and interfere with itself. And then you'll get like weird things happening for the rest of your circuit. So they, the good practice is to draw your traces at 45 degrees, so the signal can can route through can route through easily. And Altium will automatically draw most of your your connection points at 45 degrees, unless you tell it otherwise. Um, but this is usually a myth for lower frequency signals. Lower frequency signals don't really care so much about this. I always route my traces at 45 degrees because it looks pretty. And the 90 degree traces look weird. It's personal preference, but here's some information on the myth if you're, if you're interested. Um, you can also go, I don't actually know, maybe Fisher, if you know the, the cutoff for at what point would you go not do a 90? I would say like if you're in the kilohertz range or above and you really care about signal integrity. It's going to depend a lot about what you care about and what your applications are. Um, good rule of thumb is just do 45 degrees outright. Um, if you, I'd say like, Beyond like megahertz, you definitely have to start worrying about this, um, and probably like other clearances as well. Basically, what happens is like the um, the little corner on your trace starts looking like an antenna that starts radiating field off into the rest of your circuit. So, um, just like whatever freq the frequency that that happens at is determined by like the phase geometry and a couple of other things. Um, if you're interested in that, take six zero one three. They talk a lot about like how this works and like what wave transformers mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, cool. A couple other things to consider when you're doing your PCB layout, especially for many first-time PCB layouts in industry, what they'll ask you to do is insert debugging points or test points in your circuit. Really what this is, is like, um, these are signals I really care about or I think I will need to measure in post to make sure my circuit is working correctly. And you break those out as just pads that like, I can very easily take a multimeter and oscilloscope and go, boop and read it. Otherwise, I'm going to be 
The other thing sometimes people do, which you shouldn't do, is they take a wire and they solder it to little pins on their chip, and they have these large wires coming off their board, and they hook uh, oscilloscopes and stuff like that up to it. If you know you want to read a signal, put a pad on there, and then in the next revision of the board, you can get rid of the pad, right? That's what they do in industry often, especially when they're like starting with the PCB and then they move into like, when they move into production, one of the first things to go is when you move into production of your product is the test pads because you don't need it anymore. Um, the caveat to this, if you're, if you're running tests on your PCB off the production line, if you're confident enough in your PCB, you probably won't put test pads. Like I would be very surprised if Apple has test pads on the iPhone, but certain development boards, like the SparkFun development boards, there's a machine, you put the board in, it runs a bunch of tests on the circuit and you take it out. In that case, this test pad spacing here looks like it was designed to be put into a machine. You put it into the machine, the four pins come down, it tests the circuit, it lifts up, and it moves on. And the geometry of those test pads will be dependent on the geometry of the pins going, coming into the machine um, is another constraint that there could be. Um, thermals. Thermals are always fun. Um, one of the... So there's a couple ways to deal with thermals and PCBs. Often thermals have to do with, like, you're, you're talking about high-power electronics or radio frequency stuff or, like... Uh, like stuff that gets hot is like MOSFETs and uh, other, other kinds of things. Sometimes LDOs, there are weird cases. Um, it's not often, but there are weird cases where people will be running LDOs at reasonably high currents, like two or three amps, which is high for an LDO. Like an LDO is like, you're talking about like 50 milliamps to 100 milliamps is where LDOs normally operate. Um, if you, but some weird, weird cases, you do need to run an LDO like five or six amps, and then thermals become a huge problem because all the voltage you're, you're dropping is just dissipated as heat in that massive resistor that's inside an LDO. So what people will use is called thermal vias. Um, often thermal vias are either connected to a thermal plane or the ground plane. Both of these are possible. Um, so, like I was saying, like this chip over here, sometimes uh, chips that are high power have that massive pad in the middle, and that massive pad is a thermal pad. And what's happening is you have your chip, you have this pad that has a whole bunch of vias that are going down to, um, let's say this is the ground plane. Often it is the ground plane because there's no reason it doesn't need to be the ground plane. Um, or sometimes, like, what they'll do is they'll, they'll say, I'm going to send thermal vias to a large pad on the other side, and I'm going to put a heat sink on this pad because I don't want to heat sink the chip. But then um, what this system over here does when you're, heat, when you're sending thermal vias to your ground plane, now you have your entire ground plane acting as a heat sink for whatever is going on on the chip. Does that make sense? So you have a fun thermal camera image here of like, this is with thermal vias, that's without thermal vias. To clarify what this is actually doing is saying like, okay, it's um, uh, when you lay out the chip, they either did nothing or they put this thermal via array. So there's like no copper here and there's a whole bunch of copper here and it's, sinking, it's pulling the heat into the PCB rather than containing it in the chip. Um, these are considerations, especially for higher power stuff. I think there's a couple on our board, but I don't, uh, it's like definitely things we'll, we'll mention before you, before you do the layout. Um, this is what I was saying before, isolation. Uh, sometimes you'll see physical slots in, in PCBs to do, to do isolation. I won't talk about this because we did talk about it before. Um, differential pairs and signal integrity. A lot of you ask this question in lab. A differential pair is basically you route these two traces together. So every time you route a trace, right, it has a certain resistance, it has a certain capacitance, it has a certain inductance. The, um, based on those resistance, capacitance, and inductance values, noise in the environment will affect your trace a certain way. So in systems where you care about the, the, the signal that's going across um, the, your system, like for example, going into a speaker or a high-speed communication system, you'll route those signals as a differential pair to ensure they have the same resistance, inductance, capacitance, and things like that. And the idea there is if these two traces have the same resistance, inductance, and capacitance, it doesn't mean they won't be affected by noise. It means they'll be affected by noise in similar ways. And if they're affected by noise in similar ways, when you take the difference of the signal, you'll get 
relatively little noise. So you have the signal over here with noise. If I subtract those, I get, um, I get just the peak I want. Um, and you're going to have to route differential pairs in, in um, the PCB as well. Um, connectors, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief on. Essentially, you want connectors to be on the edge of your board because like, you don't want wires coming out of the middle of your board and going to all sorts of places. The exception to this rule is, of course, motherboards where there's like wires going in every which way. But even then, you'll notice they try to keep the connectors around the edge of the board. Um, yes, and I covered a lot of this stuff. So I'm just going to skip ahead. Uh, mechanical layers, you can do some fun stuff with PCBs. Um, you can make a PCB any shape you want, really. It, often it depends on the application and where it's going in. So this is an encoder chip for a motor that was designed to fit right onto the back of a motor and mount the encoder to. And this is a drone, which is fun. They put the entire drone on this PCB, including the electronic speed controllers, the flight control, and everything. And they're just going to solder the motors straight to those four holes. And then you have a drone, which has both the physical structure, because sometimes with, with like things of this scale, the small size, you don't need anything more than just the PCB. And then um, all the circuitry is there, too, so there's no wires. Um, yes, uh, this is another. Tr Oftentimes, you will see in boards that like we produce here at MIT, um, most people put their name and email on the PCB, and that's so you know, you know who to blame when it goes wrong. It's called the blame name. Especially in development, it's very common. It's just an email that you put there. So like people are like, oh, this is wrong. And you can email the person that's, that's making the board. Um, I'll be brief on these case studies. Um, so here is a torque sense CAN board. Basically, what it's doing is it's taking the input of a torque sensor, putting it through a whole bunch of resistor dividers, and spitting that data out over a CAN bus. CAN bus is a communication system. Um, for, for electronics, it's very common in vehicles as well. So you can kind of see here the good parts about this board. And I, I mean, these slides are posted, so I, I suggest you guys go take a look at this because we're running out of time because there's a couple of really good examples in here. Um, all the power stuff is over here. All the resistor, like all the resistor divider and analog signal stuff is over here as far apart on the board as possible. Um, we have some locking connectors that'll help. Um, and we have CAN bus communication. And the connectors are on the edge of the board. A couple of bad things about this board. Um, this, the CAN bus here was not routed as a differential pair. It is a differential communication signal. If it is a differential communication signal, it should be routed as a differential pair. It wasn't in this case. Um, screw terminals have a lot of resistance, could be better for isolation. And in this case, you see the bypass capacitors are under the board. Um, that was done to save space, but it's maybe not the best thing to do for bypass. Um, last board, briefly, the solar car battery management system that we talked about last time. Good stuff about this board. Um, Microcontroller, all of the components on this board are on the top, especially because this is a high voltage system. They're debugging from top down if they want to do anything like funny, like so they don't shock themselves by picking up the board or something like that. Um, there's a lot of test points out here in the middle for current sensors. There's a bunch of current sensors in, in this area that's reading current from the battery. And they've broken out test points to see exactly what the signal from the current sensor is if, they're like, if they need to debug the system. Um, another great thing they did on this board is the current, so the large switches that turn the battery on and off and disconnect and connect are large relays that produce a lot of electromagnetic interference when they switch. Um, they've moved the current sensors as far away from those relays as possible because current sensors use magnetic field to sense current. They've separated them so there's as little noise in that system as possible. A um, couple of bad things. CAN bus is not routed as a differential pair. ISO spy is not routed as a differential pair. Both of those are communication protocols. Route them as differential pairs. Um, the very large traces used to create the side of the PCB, you probably could have used pop copper pores. None of these things 